Welcome to Reluctantly Supernatural in an Age of Reason, the podcast where we explore the place of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the church. Our hosts, Pastors Mark Cowpersmith and Bob Maddox, combine their years of ministry experience to address the issues of the prophetic gifts in our modern world. Join us as they interview their guests from a wide variety of spiritual leadership backgrounds, as they share their insights on the place of the supernatural in the church and the world. And now, our hosts, Mark Cowpersmith and Bob Maddox. Uh, We're back again with Chris Vallotton in the second installment of our interview with him. And uh, in this interview, I start with a question. And the question is, given what the Bible says about the supernatural dimension of our faith and how we're called to being a part of that. Why are there so many Christians today that avoid it, that have somehow written off the whole supernatural aspect of God? And Chris goes into some really, really interesting answers to that question and that I personally find very challenging for myself, and I think everyone will. And we end up asking about prophecy and the difference between Old Testament and New Testament prophecy. And Chris goes into a really good explanation of why it's different and how our expectations of prophecy should change as a result of knowing that difference. It's a very, very interesting, good um, explanation. So let's listen. I got a question for you, rises out of a comment you made about running into those Christians that didn't believe in the supernatural dimension of the faith. And I had in the back of my mind to ask you this question, so it's a perfect moment. What, What do you think is causing that reluctance to to embrace what is really the roots of our faith. What's going on? Why is the church, the Western church, so often missed its its roots? Well, uh, probably there's probably you know a thousand questions answers to that question, but you know some of the things I think is that you know Jesus said these signs will follow those who believe. They'll heal the sick. They'll raise the dead. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll cast out demons, but I think that some people have tried to do those things as Christians. For instance, you know, I prayed for my father, he, and he died anyway. So, therefore, that can't, uh, that there must be another meaning because I, I am a Christian, and I'm not walking in miracles, and therefore, I have to figure out a way, and I don't mean this in any harsh way, but I have to figure out a way to get me under the guise of still being a Christian and then how do I, how do I, how do I view that scripture and scriptures like them that the Bible's full of them actually, you know, greater works will you do when I go to be with the father, Jesus said, Acts chapter one, don't even leave your home. Don't leave your city till you're, you're endowed with power from on high, and, you know, like on and on and on. So these scriptures are, they fill the new Testament. So how do you, so I, I think it's, um, my, this is one, one of my thoughts is that, um, When I, you know, when the way I read the scripture, I I feel like there's two ways to really read the scriptures, probably 50, but these are the ones that come to my mind. I can, I can, um, I can define the scripture by my experience, or I can define my experience by the scripture. And so I can, if I, if I don't do signs and wonders, but I know I love God, which there's so many people that that's their, you know, that's their gig. It's true. Then, then I'm like, okay, well, that can't be for today, or there's, or that's, it's just for a group, a certain group of people. Like, you know, there's like, there's probably ten or twelve ways to say not for today, or for a special group of people, or for it's not my calling, um, because uh, and so I, I reduce the scripture down to my experience. The other way to look at the scripture is that I raise my experience to match the scripture. And that's a long, uh, grueling, and, and sometimes painful process for all of us. And to choose that process and to choose that road is painful. Uh, it's uh, courageous. It's sometimes uh, cloaked in mystery and frustration and uh, disappointment. You know, when you create expectation that doesn't get yeah. fulfilled through your, your faith, what do I do with that? What do I do with this person I prayed for? Or I, you know, laid hands on them. I thought I had to get the healing. They died anyway. Maybe there was prophecies that the person was going to live. All of these things were part of New Testament life in the book of Acts. Don't despise prophetic utterances, Paul wrote. 
um, examine everything carefully, hold fast to what is good. You know, why would someone despise prophetic utterances? And well, you know, when you you prophesy and those prophecies don't come to pass, it creates hopelessness in people. You create expectation that you didn't fulfill. And, you know, so this world that we're in, uh, you know, I, and I know it very well, is um, it, it, it takes courage and it takes resilience and perseverance to, you know, to raise your level of experience to the scripture. So it's easy to see why people would, you know, lose hope in that and decide, I'm just not even going to believe that because if I do, then I, then I'm, then I'm going to face, I'm going to face defeat in that. And I'm going to have to question why am I a Christian? Am I, what happened to me? So, you know, I, I think those are the reasons why some of the reasons, at least, you know, and other people just, you know, they, they, they have a really good Christian, you know, family member or friend die and everybody prayed for them and they died anyway. You know, all of those things kind of take people down the road of, well, those verses can't be true because they don't happen to me or my friends or anybody I know for that matter, you know? Yeah, definitely. Bob, I've got a question uh, for, for Chris. And this is a good one. We've seen it, just the kind of disappointment you're talking about with an unanswered prayer for healing. We've had recent examples of disappointment with inaccurate prophetic words. Mm -hmm. And, and it, my, I'm intrigued by the difference between prophecy, the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament, and prophetic ministry in the New Testament. Uh, what do you think about the difference between prophetic ministry in the Old and New Testaments? How do they differ? Well, the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament was prophecy received because the Holy Spirit would come upon people but did not live in them. So, you know, and then also the prophet, because the, the people that they were ministering to had no chance to have the Holy Spirit within them, and basically their, their, their response needed to be to obey the prophet, Therefore, God had to have, create a balance of power so that the people who spoke in the name of God, they had lots of responsibilities, so they had, had, they had to have a very high level of accountability, right? And so, in other words, if, I, if you were an Old Testament person, the Holy Spirit came upon me, and I'm a prophet, and I say to you thus and thus, you know, sell your house and, you know, whatever, and I say God told me, and I have, and I have the office of a prophet, your only choice was to do what I told you to do. And nobody talks about this, but actually they stone people who disobeyed the prophets. Wow. And so, um, and, but here's the, here's the balance of power, which in God's brilliance, he's like, okay, but if Chris gives you a bad word and his word doesn't come to pass, then the prophet gets stoned. And this was, this was the necessary balance yeah. of power in, a, in the old covenant when Holy Spirit did not reside in people, and therefore they had no, they had no way to discern whether or not the prophet's word was from the Lord without it coming to pass. Right. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit lives within us, not just as prophets in fivefold ministry, we'll say, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, but also in the congregation and even in the world, the people, the Holy Spirit has been released into the world to convict the world of of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So when, when, uh, when, a, when a prophet or a prophetic person gives a word to somebody, that person has access to the Holy Spirit's inspiration and discernment to decide, first of all, what is the source of that prophetic word. For example, 1 Corinthians 14 says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. Interestingly, the, the connotation in the Greek is now, like, those someone's prophesying, we'll say, and then there's these prophets or prophetic company who are actually right there discerning whether or not that's the Lord. Now, prophecy is foretelling, I'm telling you about the future, and foretelling, I'm causing the future. But my point is, it's always future. So if I'm a prophet speaking the word, the word of the Lord, and you're one of the prophets judging my prophecy, in the Old Testament, the only way they could judge prophecy is whether or not it happened. In fact, that's the whole outcome, right? If the prophet's word does not come to pass, then he spoke presumptuously. But in the New Testament, you know, I just quoted First, uh, First Thessalonians 5, 
Um, do not despise prophetic utterances. Examine everything carefully and hold fast to what is good. Again, the connotation is immediately. Somebody's give you a word, and you're like, oh, that's not the Lord, or that is the Lord. How are we judging New Testament prophecy? How we judge New Te Testament prophecy is that we use the gift of distinguishing the spirits to determine the source of the word. Was that, my, was that a human spirit? And obviously an evil spirit, Holy Spirit, or maybe even an angel, right, who are also ministering spirits. And so we judge source, and we say, well, if God can't lie, which is true, then if, that, if the source is God, then that's a prophetic word. And we know that some of them come with conditions, you know, as the children of Israel, you know, Moses gave a prophetic word to the children of Israel, and out of two million people, only two people went into the land wasn't a bad word, but there was conditions to the prophetic word, which they did not meet. Sometimes uh, prophetic words take a long time to fulfill, on and on and on. But my point is, is that there, this is a completely different, um, this is a completely different prophecy in the New Testament is completely different than the Old Covenant. Also, the purpose of prophecy is very interesting, right? First Corinthians 14, that we're speaking for edification, exhortation, and comfort, <laughs> I don't think there's any comfort in the Old Testament with prophecy. I think, <laughs> nope. I think it, you know, you could if some prophet said something positive, it was always, you know, it, 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 I mean, there are a few positive words there. We've got oh, to take yeah. Jeremiah's got some good words, but I mean, most of the prophets were very, you know, I mean, they were the policemen of the old covenant. They were, right. they were policing the people of God. They were the cops who pulled you over, so to speak. <laughs> and they were grumpy old men. They tended to be, you know, they tended to, they, you know, they had a lot of power, right? Yeah. They had a lot of power. And uh, and then, you know, some of them carried it very well. And, you know, frankly, some of them didn't carry it very well. Yeah. So, yeah, so that that's the difference between Old and New Testament. You know, in, in a nutshell, obviously, there's I've written books about it. So, yes. but, you know, I think that's a good overview of it. You know, I just really appreciate that. Chris is constantly pointing to the scriptures about why uh, he believes that the prophetic ministry is for the day of course and why he believes that there's a difference between the Old and New Testament versions of prophecy. And I think one of the big barriers for a lot of people has just been that. They read about a Jeremiah or an Ezekiel or an Isaiah or Moses, and then they they wonder why well, why doesn't it happen the same way in the New Testament? And of course, there's a lot of things yeah. like that that are different. So and, he, go ahead. And they, they they feel seriously intimidated because Old Testament prophecy had to be 100 percent accurate, accurate, or they killed you. Right. <laughs> so you've got this this threat hanging over you. I can't get this wrong. I don't want to shame God. I don't want to shame His kingdom. I don't want to misrepresent Him. So we're judging present day prophecy with such a such a critical um, spirit that right. we are intimidated from doing it. And Chris really beautifully points out the difference between Old and New Testament, and it's the fact of the indwelling Holy Spirit and that, cha that, that changes and, everything. And the idea that we should judge them right when they're given. I love that he said, you know, yeah. it's only in the Old Testament, you, it either came to pass and you had to wait to see if it did and if it didn't. But yeah. here you can, at the moment, judge whether or not it's of God and know if this is something you should receive. And of course, I, I think again for, uh, you know, it's when when Paul writes the Corinthian church and mentions, you know, it's for comfort and inspiration and edification, uh, in many ways it's different. Not to say that there yeah. aren't prophetic examples like, you see in Acts where Agabus and other ones are actually prophesying the future, but uh, many of them are for the moment to encourage and to comfort people. Yeah, I really liked what he said, too. Before we got into that, he talked about uh, why so many people dismiss the supernatural dimension of our faith. And it comes down to, as he said, unanswered prayers. Yeah. You prayed for your aunt. You prayed for someone that you love deeply. They didn't live. And yet you're faced with those passes, passages of scripture, which promise uh, signs and wonders and healings. And you either have to, he said, you, you either have to define the word, the Bible, through the lens of your experience, 
or you have to define your experience through the lens of the Bible. And if you choose the first, it's easy. You just ignore those passages you don't like. Find an explanation to delete them from your practical, you know, the Bible according to Mark, the Bible according to Bob, the practical view we have of the Bible. But the second one, I need to raise my experience to the level of the Bible, interpret my experience through the Bible, not vice versa. That one's hard. Yeah. And he used the word resilient and struggle. And it's true. I, I've experienced that myself. But unanswered prayers are the big question mark that causes us to say, maybe I should just give that whole business up. But when you do that, you end up disempowering yourself and mo moving further away from the, the very nature of our faith. That's right. Yeah. Well, this has been inspirational, and uh, we want to encourage you uh, to stay tuned to our uh, podcast. You're going to hear more from Chris in the coming weeks. So God bless. We'll see you soon. Stay hungry. You've been listening to the Reluctantly Supernatural podcast with your hosts, Mark Cowpersmith and Bob Maddox. Be sure to check out our website at www.reluctantlysupernatural.com or visit our YouTube channel, Reluctantly Supernatural, for more videos and podcasts. To get a copy of our book, Reluctantly Supernatural in an Age of Reason, you can purchase it at Amazon.com or order it directly from us at our website, www.reluctantlysupernatural.com.